In this video, we'll discuss Euler angles, which is one of the ways to specify an arbitrary rotation with the help of three parameters. And we finally have a chance to talk about an idea associated with the name of Leonard Euler, one of the greatest individuals in the history of humanity, one of the greatest scientists, someone who almost single-handedly carried science for several crucial decades, someone who shaped mathematics as we know it today, and someone to whom virtually all of the ideas that are being developed today can be traced. Now, Leonard Euler may not have had as intimate a relationship with God as Isaac Newton, but his ability to create beauty was absolutely divine and second to no one. And he raised mathematics to heights that have not been challenged since and that today cannot even be conceived. So that's Leonard Euler. So now let's talk about the Euler angles themselves. Euler angles are actually a pretty straightforward topic, but there are a number of subtleties and we're about to discuss them. Now for illustration purposes, I prepared this new prop, which is smaller than the sculpture we've used until now. It's also more colorful and looks a little bit like an arrow and all of these are great advantages for the discussion we're about to have. Now as we have already discussed, an arbitrary orientation of a rigid body can be described by specifying the direction in which it points plus the amount of twist. And that's why you need precisely three parameters because it takes two parameters to specify the direction in which the body points, perhaps the latitude and the longitude, and the additional parameter specifies the twist. And these are essentially the Euler angles. We'll call them theta, phi, and psi. Theta will be responsible for latitude, phi will be responsible for longitude, and psi will be responsible for the amount of twist. Let's talk about latitude a little bit. Of course, we're all familiar with latitude from studying maps, and there are, but there are some differences. For example, on a map, latitude is zero at the equator, it's pi over two at the North Pole, and it's minus pi over two at the South Pole. Now in linear algebra and applied mathematics, the scale is usually a little bit different. We start at the North Pole, so it is zero at the North Pole, it's pi over two at the equator, and finally it's pi at the South Pole. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same concept and measures the lean away from the Z axis. So it's how far it leans from the vertical direction. So that's theta and that's latitude. Now longitude is a pretty straightforward concept that's going around the parallel. So latitude specifies the parallel, phi specifies the meridian. So once theta is specified first perhaps, and that's what actually does happen with Euler angles, then you have to specify where on the parallel you are. And that's the function of the angle phi, longitude, the east-west direction. And the convention is that it's counterclockwise as you look down the vertical axis. So the direction that we're used to being the positive direction. And then finally, there is twist. Now, all of this specifies the orientation of a body with respect to some reference orientation. So let's call this our initial orientation. So here come some subtleties. Here is subtlety number one. When you talk about specifying theta and phi, the direction in which the body points, in other words, latitude and longitude, it's important how you get there. It's important for the twist. Because suppose, let me stand here, suppose that we eventually want to get to, let's say, this orientation. And let's say, uh, we get there in two different ways. Let's consider what happens when we get to this orientation in two different ways. Well, here is the simplest way to get there, which is by a single rotation away from the z-axis by the angle theta. And we're right where we want to be. In other words, we're pointing right where we want to point. And notice that this label is straight towards you. 
Now, what would happen if we had gotten there differently? What if, for instance, we leaned it theta the other way? So it's still the same lean away from the vertical axis, but instead of leaning it this way, we leaned it this way. And then we swung around 180 degrees to achieve the orientation that we wanted. So it still points in the same theta phi direction as before. This is the desired direction. But as you notice, it's an entirely different configuration. The twist is different because previously this side of the can faced towards you and now it's this one. So in terms of specifying the overall orientation of this rigid body, it's just saying theta and phi is not enough even for the direction or more precisely, it is enough for the direction. But unless you specify exactly how you get there, you'll be completely messed up on the twist. So it's not quite enough to just give three numbers. You also have to specify how to get there. So when somebody says Euler angles, it's not just these latitude, longitude, twist angles. That's not enough. It also implies a specific way of getting there. So at first, I will show you a convention that's quite intuitive, but is actually not what's typically used with Euler angles. And then we'll talk about why a different, slightly less intuitive convention is actually better. So according to the first, more intuitive convention, you get the latitude right first, then you spin the body around to get the longitude right, and then you get the amount of twist right. More precisely, the first step is to turn it away from the vertical direction by the angle theta, and you lean it towards E1. And this quote-unquote meridian that intersects with E1 corresponds to all the points that has phi equals zero. So at first, we keep phi equals zero, and we get theta right. Let me orient it this way. So here is our uh, reference configuration, and here is step number one. So notice that step number one is actually a simple rotation with respect to the y-axis and actually in the positive direction, exactly what we want. So it will be captured by this matrix. So after step number one, theta is captured correctly, phi equals zero. Then step number two is rotation with respect to the z-axis. And that, of course, keeps, keeps theta constant. So once we get it right, it stays right. And in the, in the second step, as we spin it, rotate it around the z-axis, theta remains constant, and phi changes. So we're going to spin it until phi is right. And after the first two steps, the direction in which the, point, the body points is captured. And the only remaining rotation is the twist. So then you'll twist it by the right amount phi to get the desired rotation. So let me demonstrate it once or twice by picking an arbitrary orientation of this body and getting to it from this reference configuration and therefore determining the three Euler angles. Although these won't quite be Euler angles because this is not quite the right, of, the right order of steps. And maybe you're beginning to see why it's not quite the best order of steps. And it has to do with the very last rotation. So we'll get there. First, let me generate a random orientation of this body. I will toss it up in the air, let it tumble, and then I'll catch it. And however I catch it, that's our random orientation. So here we go. All right, here it is. Not bad. So let's remember. So this spot right here points towards you. So let's start from this orientation. Get the right lean. Okay. Then we have to end up pointing in this direction. And we're not going to go in this, like this, because that's the negative direction. So to know, to figure out what phi it is, you have to go in the counterclockwise direction as you stare down the z-axis. So there you go, those two steps. So it was about 30 degrees, pi over 6, followed by something greater than pi, maybe 5 fourth pi. Okay, and now the wrong side is pointing towards you. So we'll twist it once again in the positive direction 
which is counterclockwise as you stare down the axis of this object very carefully. This was maybe 3 pi over 2. So that maybe was about right. So it's pi over 6, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2. Let's do it one more time. Here we go. All right, pretty good. So this barcode is pointing directly at you. And actually, this is quite easy because as you can see, phi is zero because the orientation is in the x, z plane. So from this orientation, we will get, we will spin it like this. Ah, uh, this is once again, what is it? Three quarters pi, something like that. And now, once again, being very careful in the counterclockwise direction until the barcode faces you. So phi is zero. And then this was about, I wasn't really paying attention, but let's say pi. Is that about right? Yeah. From here to here. Yeah. Right around pi. So three quarters pi, zero pi. Okay. And now you see how any arbitrary configuration corresponds to precisely one unique set of these almost Euler angles. Those are not quite Euler angles because the convention has to be changed. So we're right there at subtlety number two. What is the problem with doing our turns in this order? And the problem is, if you can call it a problem, but we were really planning on using these three matrices to capture the orientation to build up that one single rotation matrix. We wanted to represent that matrix as a product of these three matrices because we understand these three matrices perfectly well. They're perfect for this stationary coordinate system. They're just great. But there is a problem with doing things in the order which is specified because the first rotation is rotation with respect to axis Y, the Y axis. So that's this matrix, that's great. The second rotation is rotation with respect to the Z axis. That's this matrix, so that's great. And then the final rotation is with respect to this axis, which is not any one of these matrices because this axis does not generally point along the X axis or the Y axis or the Z axis. So when we do things in this order, had we called that Euler angles, it would actually be a challenging task or a slightly more challenging task to express that rotation in terms of a matrix product of these three matrices. So that's the difficulty. And it turns out that it's not so hard to work around this difficulty. How would you change the order of the operations of these steps that would utilize these three matrices? Hint, actually just these two, this one's not used. And in the way that would, you would still be able to capture rather easily any or arbitrary orientation of this body. So you can pause the video and think about it, but I'll present the answer. And here's the answer. So the key is to get the twist first, because while the body, the reference configuration is aligned with the Z axis, that's your chance to use one of these matrices, more precisely this one, to get the twist right, to get the twist right. So once you get the twist right, you will then lean it away from the z-axis, which is this transformation, just as before, and then once again rotation with respect to the z-axis to get the longitude right. So the trick is to do this first, to get the twist right first. So if you get the twist, then the lean, and then the east-west direction, then you can get to any orientation by using these three matrices. And as you saw, we really didn't use this one because it was Z, Z, Y, Z, Z, Y, Z. These are the only two matrices we need. So that's the solution to the problem. So according to the standard Euler angle specification, and once again, it's not just a collection of three numbers, it's how you get there. So according to the proper conventional Euler angle specification, twist comes first, then the latitude, and then finally the longitude. And why am I saying that could have been the end of the video? But why did I say that this is a less intuitive convention? Well, it's less intuitive 
Because if I did the same sort of experiment, right, uh, and we had to achieve this precise orientation in this order, in the second, more conventional order, then you don't really know the twist. Because if you think that this is the right twist, so in other words, you will do the twist first where the orientation is just right, right? The barcode was kind of pointing in that direction. And then do the lean. And then do the spin. Well, there you go. You just messed up your twist. So you kind of have to go back and sort of premeditate, pre-guess the twist that you're supposed to give it at first so that it's right at the end. So if this was a common thing to do, toss up an object in the air, catch it, and try to capture the resulting orientation uh, by a matrix, then somehow I would try to rescue the first convention and figure out how to do it right. Because according to the second convention, it would actually be rather difficult to guess what twist to initially give it so that after the second two steps, it's right. And when you do things on the computer and everything is super fast and you don't do any of the hard algebra yourself, it doesn't really matter. Especially when you're using these three angles to formulate and then later solve the dynamic equations, let's say, for, the, for rigid body dynamics. So ultimately, this, slightly, this being slightly less intuitive does not play much of a big role and is not really a big negative. So there you go. That's what Euler angles are. It's these three numbers in combination with the right order of steps. And now we're perfectly set up to put these three matrices together into a single matrix that captures an arbitrary orientation of a rigid body in the three-dimensional space. In other words, a matrix that represents an arbitrary rotation with respect to the Cartesian basis. And that's precisely what we're going to do in the next video. And we'll, we'll come up with those matrices or that matrix and discuss its properties.